Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, President of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. I'm your host, Steve Meredith, and I'm joined in studio today, appropriately about 12 feet apart during these COVID riddled (laughs) times by President Wyatt. Scott, good morning. How are you? Terrific. It's good to see you there on the other side of the room. Yeah. Uh, when, when you want me to talk, just uh, send up a little flare, and, uh, and that, that way I'll notice. So this has been uh, an interesting semester for a lot of reasons, COVID-1, uh, but one of the things that, that we have been uh, talking about during our, uh, really, our, our 2020 uh, podcast season is innovation, and you and I harp on that a lot. And we decided that we would go visit, uh, revisit some of our innovations and see how they are doing and see what the highs have been and, uh, and maybe if there have been any lows or any changes necessitated by uh, feedback or whatever, what, just, just to check back in with our innovations and see how they're doing. And, uh, and we have two guests that are great staff members from here at SUU today to talk about one of those innovations. Why don't you introduce them? Yeah, this is really a great topic because this is the topic about students succeeding, you know, sticking um, to the task and going all the way to completion. We're delighted to be joined today with, um, by Ryan Bailey, who is the coordinator of completion and student success, and uh, Eric Kirby, who is an assistant vice president for student affairs, and possibly the chief retention officer. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's uh, so. If we if we go back, this is one of those um, good reviews. But if we go back, um, when I arrived at Southern Utah University, we were on a multi year retention trajectory that was going down. Yes. And, it had and been I think going 63 down. or 64 percent was right about where we were when you arrived. I, mean, I, I just happened to be writing a document about this, so I, <laughs> I have that ready off the top of my head. I don't remember <laughs> how many years the trend was going down, but it was four or five or six. And um, it, it was interesting because the, the graduation rate was actually going up and retention was going down, which, mm-hmm. which we knew that the result of that would be that the graduation rate would follow the retention rate and eventually start dipping, and it did. Um, But we knew we had to do something about retention, and we had been doing so many things. Um, I say we. None of us were here at the time, but the school had been doing so many things, but none of them were taking. Um, And so we flipped everything around, and we hired um, a new vice president and said, uh, your focus is outcomes. And then he hired Eric Kirby and said, your focus is retention. And ultimately, Eric Kirby hired Ryan (laughs) (laughs) as the the old ace. The original ace. The original ace. One of them, yeah. Um, Anyway, let's let's talk about the ACES program. Eric, why don't you tell us what, what ACES stands for and just a brief history of it. Absolutely. So ACES stand for Assistant Coaches for Excellence and Success. And as, as you mentioned, President, <clears throat> these are peer mentors, peer mentors, upper class yeah. students that have typically survived the rigors of, of first, second year, kind of know their, their way around the classroom, around campus and can answer a lot of those questions. And when, when you're looking at retention as a whole, I often get asked, is there a silver bullet? And the answer is no. But if I had to pick one, peer mentorship would probably be the closest thing to a silver bullet. In, in helping change uh, the culture and what, what you're trying to do in, in retention. So th- the history of it, real quick synopsis, and then we can dive into anything we, we, we want to. Going back six years, we recognize as we started studying Generation Z 
that this was a group that was, was coming in and needed, I, I, I use this lightly, but a lot of hand-holding. It's a group that has been overshadowed by what's been termed as helicopter parenting or, or lawnmower parents, and consequently, in many regards, to no fault of their own, need a, need a lot of help. More importantly, they're looking for that advocacy, that friendship, that, that type of mentorship as, as they transition from high school to college, which can be really scary. So we, we eliminated our, our orientation program. We eliminated uh, our O leaders is what they were called. And Ryan was one of our original O leaders that then transferred into being one of our aces and, and recognized that one of the problems we were facing at SUU, we were, we were dealing with chunks. So our presidential ambassadors were doing great at recruiting, and then they would transfer them over to our O leaders that were just responsible for the students over the summer. Mm. And then as soon as the summer was over, our orientation leaders would then transfer them to, wait, no one. No one was waiting for the freshmen once school started. So we needed a, to develop a system that was a tad bit seamless that, that provided a, a, a smooth handoff from our presidential ambassadors on the recruitment side to really going the full year that that freshman was around on, on campus. And we weren't just saying, welcome to SUU, glad you hung out with us over the summer, see you later. So, so by understanding Generation Z, understanding that it was just a rough transition into the university for these students who needed a little extra help, that, that was kind of the, the basis um, foundation for us wanting to develop something that was a little bit more um, uh, suitable for, for the needs of the students. And that, that was the impetus, if you will, for the ACES program. Ryan, you've been working on this from the beginning. Yeah. Um, originally, I said no to being an ACE um, and then came back around. But yeah, I've, I've been here as a student and a grad assistant and now as a staff member. So it's been a, a fun journey for sure. Yeah, he's, he's been from the get-go in the weeds and he's he's been through the good, the bad, the ugly and everything in between. And so... We can definitely dive into some of that stuff as well, but um, it, it's taken a lot of different forms. different forms uh, to, to where it is now, where I think, well, granted, every year we, we tweak and we modify, but we, we started off with eight. There were eight original aces, and now, uh, due, to, due to, I think, our, our proven ability, um, we're now up to 26 full-time aces. Um, and each ace is assigned to how many students? Yeah, they're about 110. Yeah, the the average, I actually just did some numbers yesterday, not in preparation, just coincidence, but um, about 126 That's is correct. the average cohort as of yesterday. Ryan, why does this work? Um, or, or how do you know that it works? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've done a lot of data, um, and some of it's pretty accurate, and some of it's more of that um, look at it and see how things flow. Um, but we get a lot of positive feedback from students as they visit with their ACE, um, whether it's coming on a visit over the summer and getting prepared to go. We, we constantly rate 9.8, 9.9 out of 10 on average for these surveys that we survey students. Um, we feel like we've done our part, you know, teaming up with other student fairs and completion student success initiatives to help retention go up. And obviously seeing that number rise, we feel like, um, is good, but I think it just provides, a different support system that's tr than traditionally been offered maybe on campus where there's always been staff members, there's always been academic advisors, financial aid counselors, but this way every student has another student where maybe they can ask the nitty gritty questions or you just did this last year, how did you combat tough roommates or asking somebody on a date or homesickness and they're getting some feedback from someone who's in their own shoes, which I think has been really successful. Yeah, and I, I think as well, that two of the things that, that really help this be successful, and this is just all of us in, in the consumer world, we hate getting the bounce around. Yep. We, we hate calling an entity or a company or a credit card, whatever, and going for four to five, six people. And, and oftentimes, um, that, that frustration leads to us either backing out of the company or not pursuing, but the ACE is, is basically the one-stop shop for all incoming students. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. We, the ACE contacts their, their incoming student within 24 hours of that student depositing at SUU and basically says that much. I am your one-stop shop. I am your end-all and be-all of anything you need. I may not know the answers, but I'm going to get you to where you need to go. 
And so that student doesn't have to know where the registrar's office is or where the cashier is or how to make that payment. Or They just need to know they need to contact their ACE. They need mm -hmm. one number, one name, and that's it for their entire first year. And I think that has relieved a lot of pressure from both parents and students knowing this is the only person I need to contact to get answers. And they may not know it, but they're gonna get me to, to where I need to go. And I think that is what's made it so successful. And then as, as Ryan alluded to, too often uh, what we find with this generation is they're, un, they're, they're not as willing to talk to administrators about problems that they're having. Um, but they are so used to on social media or just with their friends asking or talking about, hey, I'm struggling or, hey, I need help here. This is a dumb question, but where's the GC at? Or how do I register? And they're far more comfortable to, to go to a peer than they are to their parent or to an administrator. So I think those two things uh, alone have, have really given uh, this program some success there. Well, and you've got an office that everybody knows. It's prime real estate yeah. in the student center. And that was big for us getting the, that space. How long have you had that space? Yeah, so that space, uh, we re, we've been in three years now. We're heading into our third year now. And that, that space used to be student government. Um, that was SUUSA space. And um, back in the day, we, we kind of gave some ultimatums to student government, start using that office more effectively to, to help students out. And um, at the end of the day, they, they realized that they weren't going to be able to do what, what the ACEs were going to be able to do. So we swapped and, and slid student government over, and ACEs come, came in and, We've turned it into what we call the nest, which is the, the student center on campus. It's, it's the equivalent of a kiosk in the mall. It's, it's the stop you go to and you get maps, you get help. We get students coming in asking for dating advice. We get students coming in asking where to get a haircut, to where, where to buy clothes. How to, it, it's fun, the questions, but it's, it's unreal the amount of students and not just first year students either. It's, it's starting to turn into, we're seeing sophomores, juniors, seniors, graduate students come in and, and getting help there at, at our, our one-stop shop. Yeah, it's been it's been fun. And some of them, their condition now that they've had the nest for a couple of years. So these older students have set an expectation that I can go so there. So the but, nest, that's the name of the Yeah, the, the center, center, the, space, the student help yeah. center. Yeah. But just yesterday, we had a senior that came in and asked where the ELC is, um, which isn't too far. And they said, I'm, I'm a senior, I should know this. Where's the ELC? Where's the <laughs> testing center? And it was it was just a cool reminder that the that's why we're there. And one of the aces brilliantly just chatted with them and then, and then walked them as far as they needed um, to go and and got them connected. So yeah, and, and President, going back to your question, how how do we know that this is, is successful? We we looked at data in our our post orientation survey under the old model. Um, which was, I believe, what do we call it? Flight Academy? Flight, F flight School. Flight School. Before yeah. we even had a pilot program here, it was called Flight School. We changed it to Thunder U after we... we before we had a flight program. Yeah, Correct. flight yeah. program. Yeah. Aviation program, yeah. we called it Flight School. Flight School, and then we changed it to Thunder U. But, but looking at post or, or, or old survey data compared to our, our current summer model of what the ACEs are offering through personalized visits, which is, is a new thing, and... And then also doing um, surveying at the end of the first year and things like that. In comparison, it's it's night and day. It's we were in the five points out of a ten ten point scale. We were five, six, maybe seven on the high end on a few of the questions. And now we're consistently. I don't even think we go below nine on the current asking the same questions about satisfaction of, of their visits or do they feel they have a, a person on campus that they can trust or, or is advocating for them do they feel more comfortable being ready to come to college do they feel they know where to go for help all of these questions have skyrocketed under the new program so it, through the data-driven decisions we're making um we we feel that this is where and then a lot of anecdotal as, as far as just students expressing help phone calls from parents high school counselors other things saying this is amazing that one-on-one -on -one personalized experience you give to every incoming student for their entire first year. So we had um, we had a gorgeous campus, uh, caring faculty, small class sizes. Um, the culture and nature of the university was the same before and after. Um, what changed was the university, we abandoned a whole series of retention initiatives that didn't seem to be working, started the ACES program, and retention has grown every year since then. Yeah. So, um, and your surveys suggest that students um, really like it far better than other programs. So that seems like it's pretty good evidence that this is the secret sauce. 
Yeah, 10% increase in retention in, in four years. It's more like 13 or 14. Yeah, if, if percentage points, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Percentage increase or percentage point increase. That's right. Yeah. Um, well, so um, what has gone well in the innovation? So in terms of making the shift, starting a new program, that's very different than anything that had been done in the past. Um, what are the couple things that have gone well or better than expected? Yeah, I'll, I'll, you, ju- I'll jump in and, uh, and feel free to. Uh, I, I think I think some of the things that have gone really well: uh, personalized visits. Yeah, this was something that w- we were we were basically getting rid of best practices um, by eliminating these. Previously, students had to pick from one of 10 days to come to campus over the summer. And and we spoon-fed every student the same thing. It was a, it was a set orientation where we said, here are the 10 things or or whatever you need to learn. And we treated every student the same. And that's what, that's what best practices across the nation said was great for orientation. We got rid of that model. And we said, you know what? This generation wants, wants individualized attention. And our, our surveys, when we look back at the previous five years, were actually indicating that, that students didn't want to know about X, Y, and Z. They want to know where to get housing. They want to know where to pay the financial aid. So we eliminated that and created this personalized visit system where every student can, can choose from about 32 different things that they want to do on an individualized basis over the summer. They set that up electronically. It goes right to their ACE. The ACE then goes about creating that customizable schedule for them and says, sends them back an itinerary saying, Welcome to SUU. It sounds like you want to take care of financial aid. You want to meet with the Veterans Center. You want to get a tour of our PE building. You want a personalized tour of your classrooms. You want to meet with the dean. In fact, here's your itinerary. Plan on about six and a half hours on campus. I look forward to seeing you. That is not in the best interest of us as a university. It is a right. very time-consuming model. Yeah. But, but that was something that I think went extremely well and has been very positive in, in ensuring that every student is, is accomplishing what they need to when they when they when they arrive and we're not we're not presuming we know what they want we're, we're allowing them to tell us what they're feeling uncomfortable with what they're uneasy about and i i think that was a big shift we were the only ones at that time that i was aware of that was doing anything like that and so that was a big gamble to go against best practices and say we're, we're going to do something completely different that is not staff friendly uh, or time friendly to, to offer this to all 2,000 plus incoming students. That would be one thing I'd. Yeah, and I, I think it, it did take some time, but it, it's really helped the students present when you talked about that before the ACEs, after the ACEs, the culture, the campus, it didn't change much, but that allowed these students to participate, to start in that culture before they ever get here because they got to meet with their advisor. They got to meet with you know, Carmen Aldridge in, in the Disability Resource Center or the Career Center or the Honors Program or these things that they desperately want information of. Um, so that was that was very big um, and, and worked really well. And I think um, one thing that we, we started pretty early, whether it was the ACEs before they kind of got their cohorts or not, is we decided to be pretty intrusive and... Um, Sometimes that can be scary or seem annoying or that we're, we're bugging students, but we average over 30 contacts per student per ACE, if that makes sense. Is that the way I want to say it? Each so ACE each, yeah, average yeah, con- yeah, yeah. contacts their students about 30 times over the summer. That's an average. Um, and then we started doing things beyond just you know emailing and phone calling. We had students get um, Google numbers so that you know their information is protected, but text their students. We found these preferred methods of communication, and we didn't shy – away from them um so with the goal of teaching them hey you should still check your email because your professors might send you your syllabus or important information but i'm going to work with you on the avenue that that works best for you um and we've always encouraged that this year we've got aces that have made um opt-in group me's for their students where the students can opt in and the aces are sending updates about campus events or or things like that um we've we've had some unique trial and errors in that way too but i think we've always had this goal of, of, of being impactful and being in, intrusive in communication, which has helped us, you know, stay the course and make sure we're not letting folks slip through the cracks, even though they might send text after text and call after call and voicemail and email after email. 
eventually I, I think we've seen the fruit in that persistence as well. So that's 30 outgoing contacts. Correct. That, that's yeah, not counting include, the yeah. student no, coming not their, their direction. And, and the other thing is when we say personalized, I, I think sometimes we, we may just think we're throwing that word out, but it, it's truly each of our aces get to know their students personally. Um, and, and let me describe some of the ways we do that. We have an intake questionnaire. We, we call it the TTQ, but it's the T-Bird takeoff questionnaire where we ask every incoming student a series of about 64 different questions that help us gauge, that help us identify some red flags, some success, things like that, but it allows us to get to know the students. Each ace is responsible for creating what's called a scorecard on their student where they basically rank the likelihood of that student's ability to persist and graduate here at SUU. The, the ACE creates a, a portfolio where they take the student's photo so they can start getting to know their face associated with their name. They start identifying fun facts in the TTQ about their student. Do they like Diet Coke? Do they have cats? And they also keep notes from the personalized visit uh, on, on these students. Hey, this student's going to a Lake Powell trip. This student is interested in music. This student is, is trying out for the dance team. And the ACE is consistently reviewing these notes and will do just-in-time personalized outreach. Hey, good luck on the tryout today. Hey, I know you had a math test today. Hey, I know you're a big fan of Diet Coke. I could use a drink. Do you want to come down and, and get a drink with me? It's personalized in that level. In, in we, We've come to realize that fostering that, that genuine friendship is critical to, to having that success and that trust where these students will come back over and over and over again to that ACE for, for help, guidance, and registration advice. When their grades are plummeting, they have someone they can go to and say, hey, I really could use that Diet Coke right now. I, I really hit the low on my math class. Can you help me? And, and those relationships are formed. So it's not personalized, meaning we just know their name. I mean, these ACEs are, are trained they usually go through about 70 to 100 hours of training before they start reaching out to their cohorts um, through social skills, through handshake skills, eye contact skills, name memorization, um, FERPA, diversity training, pronouns, you name it. These students are trained on it, even dining etiquette, mm -hmm. um, dress protocol. So they are ready and willing to truly offer a, a unique, personalized experience for every single student who who. Uh, is in their cohort and it's something that is is really cool to see in in action and it, it changes lives these students feel it uh, from the very first outreach and and they know they've got someone on campus that cares about them it's it's fun to see mm -hmm. so we've talked about it from the incoming students perspective what's life for an ace like yeah i'll, I'll kick it over to ryan <laughs> since he, he's lived it and now he oversees it <laughs> yeah they, they are busy students um it it doesn't seem to ever stop it's you know um it, it seems like it would be a certain personality type so it's not just a student that's a junior or senior yeah but the kind of person that would be very comfortable saying yeah and, and you know reaching out all the time and being in, in yeah so so i would say you know they need to have either a willingness to learn or pretty good um, time management skill but as far as personality we do like a mix we, we try our best to make sure that the aces program mirrors campus um so you have some introverted introverts type. extroverts oh, um, domestic students international students students from utah students from out LGBTQ male female students. Yeah, exactly yep. so so we don't necessarily look for for just our extroverts i'm actually an introvert in my heart of hearts or more introverted i guess if so if i had a whole team of extroverts i might go crazy but um mo mostly if they have that willingness to learn and and to stretch themselves um, that's it. But it is a lot of training at first, a lot of listening to, to anecdotes from me. Um, usually we try to invite guest speakers, um, whether it's, it's, uh, Dr. Kirby, Eric, <laughs> or, you know, even we've had president White in the past and, and the Mindy Benson's, you know, the, the president's cabinets come in and share leadership skills and things like that. But once they get their students, it's, it's kind of all hands on deck. I give them, I say some, a decent amount of, um, so what I'm looking for, <laughs> um, here's what you should do instruction. Yeah. But as they get to know their students, I really rely on them to be the expert on Johnny or on Michaela or on insert student's name. And so we arm them with the abilities to, to know resources on campus. We teach them and practice with them about how to say, what does the student really need? Is this, is this it? Or is this just the tip of the iceberg? We ask them, and train them on, on asking questions and, and digging deeper and 
surface level be, besides, you know, getting to know your student. And so they're busy. It's in the summer. They're, they're 40 hours a week. Those scorecards that Eric was talking about, that takes up a lot of time because it's not just go through and, and, and write things down. It's, it's analyze and it's make game plans for each individual student. And they make a communication plan for each student. And I give them about 10 points. So they have a starting point. But beyond that, if, if they find out someone likes cat and it's national cat day, you know, we help them learn that that might be a great thing to send your student to let them know that you're there and that you love them and you care about them. And it's not just always business, 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 mm-hmm. but it's, it's them. So that's the summer we, we we invite the students to come. And I think that's maybe the favorite thing of the aces. Um, I would say that was my favorite thing, but I constantly hear these personalized visits where they get a chance to finally meet face to face with their students and connect them. Um, and we do about um, eight to 900 of those visits a summer. So, so they're pretty wow. busy there. And then transitioning to school, they only work 20 hours a week compared to 40. And so their time management has to increase with school and, significant others and friends and roommates move back, but it's, it's kind of a 24 seven life as an ACE anyways of what your students need and finding a way to get them there. Uh, we do one-on-one required one-on-one meetings with students and ACEs each semester as a check-in. And sometimes students take that one meeting and that's enough. And other times students are coming in bi-weekly, <laughs> weekly, monthly in between as needed. But yeah, they're, they're they're really busy and their main focus is that cohort and we've actually pulled some things away from the aces to give them more time to do that other responsibilities they used to have yeah and i I think as well it's worth noting that it's it's not all roses at times Mm -hmm. um when when i oversaw them for three years and then for the past three that that ryan's been doing it you run the risk of high burnout rate with, with these with these peer mentors because it is it's go 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 they're getting texts nonstop, and we try to help them understand setting up barriers and parameters but they're getting texts at two in the morning from students that have just had a mental breakdown. They're getting texts at, at 3 a.m. From, from a discussion from a student who just came out of the closet to their mom and dad and has now been disowned, and they need to pick their pieces up the next morning. So so these ACEs are, are taking students to evening club events or, or chaperoning. Or, or they do a mix of everything. So I view one of Ryan's roles as, as kind of a – the, the ace of the ace is often what I call call Ryan because he's responsible for making sure the aces are good. The aces mm-hmm. take care of their students, but he's doing regular one-on-ones with the aces. Um, you're also going to see us have some fun with the aces because we recognize in this high-paced, high-demand environment, they need to relax and unwind as well. So we make sure they're familiar with CAPS. They're doing a lot of uh, uh, take self-care, but you'll see us out playing wiffle ball or playing giant Jenga because these aces need time to unwind and and, and do that as well. So it's, it's awesome, but, um, it, you can run a, you can run a really high burnout rate with, with what these aces go through. So for, for, um, for an innovator who is trying to create a program like this or a different program, um, what have been the difficulties? What is, has there been a mistake made? Yeah, there been, <laughs> I think, I think one or two Never. for sure. Give us, <laughs> give us a couple examples of, um, things that didn't go right and how you work through that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll jump in just some, some of the stuff that from, from the beginning, when we originally created the ACEs program, we, I don't think we fully grasped the potential of what the ACEs could be and what they could mean to their students. So we had them locked, locked away. I'm using air quotes there, but we had them assigned to an academic advisor. And we thought that dividing the students up by cohort based on major may be best and that the ACEs could help alleviate some of the the burden that our academic advising team was feeling. So ACEs in in the early years were responsible for helping add or drop a class, um, helping fill out a form, or maybe helping our advisors do some some group advising. Probation students. Probation students, meeting with probation students. But as we started recognizing that in many instances, the students would would gravitate more to the ACEs for a lot of these these one-offs, we recognized that the potential was huge. So that, that was a good trial and error. It was, a, it was a good foundation, but we broke them off of the academic advising and they just reported to me at that point in just an, an ambiguous field. They were just my peer mentors. Yeah. And we started taking them by cohort, but we, we continued to leave them broken up by major. And uh, that failed miserably because um, if you look at... if 
if you look at how connections are formed and, and other things like that, they're, they're more gradual as opposed to just by major. And, and more importantly, I'm stereotyping here, certain majors carry certain personalities. And so some of the aces struggled with just dealing with all groups of engineers. Yeah, um, that was my that was, student I think, cohort. Your, yeah. And one of my colleagues had the theater students who are a little bit more typically, stereotypically engaging. So we'd come to these meetings and she would rave about, I had these calls and these experiences and then I started to feel like I was it's like these engineering yeah. students aren't returning my calls. Yeah. They, they want nothing to do with me. They're kind of structured and they, they're, yeah. they're going and we're obviously stereotyping here. So we went back of just, it's, it's, there's no rhyme or reason as a student trickles in, Ryan just assigns them on down the list. And so every ACE is assigned engineering students, theater students. It's, it's a hodgepodge. It's a, it's a good demographic. Students have the ability to change an ACE if they're, they're just not gelling. We'll, we'll get them with an ace that, that better suits their needs. But th those were a couple things right off the bat that, that we definitely recognized that it needed to be more organic as opposed to a forced mm -hmm. assignment. Um, that was that was a big shift in, in why we – the other thing is getting the cohorts down. We, we started with our cohorts way too big. When we had eight aces to begin with, we're dealing with two, 300 students per ace. And – that didn't allow for that personalized attention, which is, I think, the essence of what we're trying to do. And I even argue that that I think 120, where we're currently at 124, is still a little too much for an ace to really get personalized. Mm -hmm. But um, being able to get these cohorts down uh, has, has really been a big thing. Creating the year-long experience, where before we, we tried a summer transition into a fall transition, that was another mistake we made. Now we sign our aces to a year-long contract and say you're in it from May to May. If you want to go on a study abroad, if you want to do other things, this isn't the program for you. We need you here for the for the full year. That was another mistake we made, but I think we got that correct. What, what, Ryan, what yeah, else would you that add? That was a big one. I think the other thing, going back to your point, Steve, is I think especially when our cohort was by major, we looked for probably the incorrect things in our student mentors to join the team. Does your major – because – yeah. Ideally, we'd hire an engineering major to oversee the engineering majors. And I think we were missing some of those diamond in the rough people that came in and actually got what we were going for, got the vision, got the the fire. And so when we switched to that, to that um, randomized cohorts, it allowed us to break away from some of those. They were uh, this leadership role on campus, so they'd be good. And, and we allowed students to apply. And we interviewed them and we, we asked them those questions and probably not the most typical interview questions are the ones we ask. How do you, you know, define love? How would you, you know, if you had an ace, what was your experience? If it was good, tell us about it. If it's bad, tell us about it. Um, and, and we were able to, I think, find some students that traditionally we wouldn't have found that, that really changed our program. Yeah. Well, what you've, what you've really created is a concierge service. Yeah. And, so what you're trying to do is hire students that are inclined to be successful at that kind of a service yeah. rather than randomly selecting um, a student from each major. You're just, this is your um, public relations team yeah. or uh, personal service team or however we describe that. So you, when, I, when I think about this program, I'm, I'm thinking of what an amazing experience it is for the ACEs. What an education for them. Yeah. Uh, a job where they can get paid, but an amazing education. Um, so that's those are a couple of the challenges. Um, what about second year? The, the ACEs, the goal isn't retention. The goal is graduation. Yeah. yeah. Um, retention is, of course, one step towards it. Um, it's a means to the end. Um what are we doing for the sophomore to junior retention? Yeah. So after we realized that we didn't have a smooth transition between our recruitment team and us, and I think for the first three years and kind of buckling the ACEs program down and getting that going, we then recognized we didn't have a smooth transition from first to second year. That really after, after the student completed their freshman year, their first year at SUU with the ACE and all the attention they were getting as they headed into that, that summer before their sophomore year, we basically said, Thanks. We'll, we'll see, see you later. later. Yeah. And, and we recognize that's not a good model. So as we started developing the ACEs program, we started keeping some ACEs. We started with just four of them. And, um, 
and they fed into what we call the SOAR program, which is our, our sophomore success program. That's S O A R. S O R. That's exactly right. And you're, you're starting to see Not a lot of things. I like, just want to be. No, yeah. like Nest Clear. and SOAR and things like that. We're the Thunderbirds here. And so a lot of it plays off this, this kind of bird um, mentality. But so the, the other reason for that is, is across the nation, you're dealing with what's called the sophomore slump. At Southern Utah University, we were experiencing about a 13 to 15 percent of our soft, our freshmen, or excuse me, our sophomores were not coming back for their junior year. So we we were, and it's not uncommon just for SUU. It's a it's a na- nationwide problem. The sophomore slump. So we started tackling that by keeping some of the aces. We started calling them soar aces, S O A R. They're now called leads, um, but our leads are responsible for as soon as that first year is over, our first year aces will introduce them to their lead and say, hey, we want to let you know that we have a program that's for our second year students. And it's not like it's, it is, but it isn't like our first year program because some students are ready to be done with their ace at that point. They're like, it was great the first year, but I'm I'm ready to need it now. Yeah, I don't need it now. And so we help them understand that they're going to have a lead there that's going to be there for them, just like their ace. But the lead's going to be very intentional in helping them start taking that next step up. We're going to start connecting them with jobs. We're going to start connecting them with internships. We're going to start developing professionally. We're going to start letting them know about resume uh, workshops. We're going to start introducing them to, to career fairs and to setting them up with alumni that they're interested in. So more of that middle ground that we're there to, to hold their hand if they still need it a little bit. We're there to help them with class registration, things like that. But we're ready to help them advance as far as they want to go. So we've been doing the, this LEADS program now for three years. And it, it's a program that, that, that I, I oversee. And I think we're seeing some success with our sophomore persistence. We, we've seen about a 5% increase among our sophomore to junior. But, but I think more importantly is we're minimizing the melt that was occurring after our first year into our second year, because now that summer, while the aces are worried about incoming students, our leads now make sure that after that first year, they're reaching out to all of these students that are now going in their sophomore year. They have a set communication plan. They're doing specific outreach. How's your summer going? What are you most excited about your sophomore year? We offer personalized visits for all of our sophomore students that they can come onto campus and get a linked profile set up. We do a a professional headshot for them if that's what they want to do. So it's unique. It's not class tours. It's more customizable for our our sophomores. And uh, this year was the first time our leads are starting to go after juniors a little bit. Ideally, what we want to do is continue to have a big ACES program at the beginning, but then have leads for all sophomores, juniors, seniors. Their cohorts can be a little bit bigger because usually the students aren't as demanding or need as much time, but start catering to what each of these demographics need. Sophomores are very different than what seniors need and offer the the career assistance, offer the help, offer the graduation assistance that they need. And so it's been fun piloting a lot of a lot of these things um, with with these groups. We, we do third week surveys, both with our freshmen, but also our sophomores. We call them temperature checks. And it's very telling on what sophomores need versus freshmen. And our leads and aces uh, are very responsive in what our students need and, and what they're doing and going after. Yeah. And I think it allows, you know, originally when we tried this SOAR program, we were kind of splitting cohorts a little bit. Yep. And we saw these students, these aces, who, you know, they're developing themselves. We, we give them all this responsibility, but sometimes I, I know I forget that they're sophomores, seniors, juniors, needing these same things that we're but it kind of got too much to, to remember, okay, now I've got my how to work with freshman hat on. Yeah. And then, and so I think a big step and a big success, you know, as we talked about these innovations, was separating them so that the sore aces or now the leads can wear the sophomore upperclassman hat their whole time. And then the aces can wear their freshman hats and really do the work and not have to well, this isn't working. Well, yeah, because you're treating them like you did last year mm. and they don't need that or um, things like that. So, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I was listening to you talk about um, this generation that's coming in as freshmen and everything you said about them describes me. So I, um, I'm i not sure I buy this generation um, stereotype. Sure. Because I think that the whole society shifts and I think that um, it just might be more pronounced when it's the younger group that's showing up at college. But, President, uh, you need me just, to be your ace. 
Yeah, I Because I'm a year older than you. <laughs> you are. I can take you to get a Diet Coke if you want. <laughs> in fact, if you guys want an expert to come in and chat about Diet Coke, I'm, You're I'm, there. I'm your guy. Okay, okay. President, I'll take him up on well, that. It, um, if, I have to, if, I, if I have to stand in line and, and listen to 10 bullet points from somebody about everything and I'm only really interested in one of them, I think we're all kind of in the same sure. the boat. We all want things to be relevant. We all want people to think that we're interested in that person rather than what I'm interested in telling you. Um, so this just seems like this is really smart. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with you. I think, I think by and large, the, the customer service side and just treating people with respect and developing that culture of that concierge type service, I think that applies to all of us. In, um, some, in some ways, it's more inefficient. In some ways, it's more, more efficient because... You, you spend time telling me 10 things. Let's assume that I'm a new employee and you give me the list of 10 or 20 things. I'm not going to hear any of them because you're giving me 20. But if you give me the things that I'm most interested in or most need today and then give me the things that I need next week, then um, it works more efficiently for me and for the person delivering it, I would think. Yeah. And, it you know, it, it, it's fun. When when the ACES program was created, I remember as we headed into spring semester, as we um, a lot of the ACES toward the end of spring semester would come up and be like, Kirby, I, I think I'm failing as an ACE. My student won't reach out to me anymore or won't come in and for help. And I give them two thumbs up and say, you've done your job. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's the success. Fly, if, little bird. That's fly. exactly right. Yep. If, if the student is still coming in at the end of spring semester and needs everything done for them, it, it means you haven't done your job. And so... The ACEs, one of the things we, we do, and I often talk with parents about this, they, they'll say, well, it sounds like a lot of handholding. I said, it is up front, but it's not that the ACE does everything for them the entire time. An example, first time a student comes in and says, hey, where's the financial aid office? The ACE will say, yeah, let, let me walk you down there. What, what, do you, what do you need? What are you doing? And the ACE will talk with them a little bit. The second time the student comes in, hey, I, I need help with the financial aid office. Okay, cool. Let me coach you a little bit on on what conversation are you going to have? Who are you going to ask for? I'll be there in the back, but this is you now. And then the third time that student doesn't show up to the nest. So, so, so much of it is the aces are great at coaching them along the way that by the end of spring semester, we're there if the students need us, but our goal is that the students don't need us. And yeah. it's, it's a weird model to say it that way, that our goal is to make sure students don't come back back to us yeah. that, that we've trained them enough that they feel comfortable on their own and that our aces by the end of spring semester feel like a proud parent if you will that these students are now on their yeah. own they're out flying they're out doing their own thing and they're ready to transition into the soar program which will take them to the next level and yeah. it's it's fun seeing these students come in at the end of spring semester just thanking their ace the amount of gratitude that yeah the little gifts little trinkets little things saying thank you i now have confidence i now have the abilities thank you for believing in me and being there for me when I needed you most. You know, when I was a college student uh, forever ago, not quite as long ago as Steve, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually, I, I think I had some aces, but they were informally created, just um, friends that were older than me. So the program that you've got is um, is making sure that everybody has somebody. Yeah. yeah. Right? Because some... If we have a big brother or a big sister or a friend or neighbor or somebody in a club that looks out for us, this just makes it so that everybody has somebody and then they're better trained to know all the answers. Ryan, what's so if what is your number one takeaway from being from start to finish as a student and graduate student and now employee in this program? Full time employee. Yeah. What's your number one takeaway for people that want to create something different? Yeah, I, th I think if I could just go back, a lot of people look for that silver bullet. And I think we get contacted by schools and, and even in the past, other programs on campus have, have seen the, the good work and said, what are you doing? Give us give us your training manual. Give us that silver bullet. And um, especially as a younger professional, as I was maybe the graduate my first year, I was like, yeah, it is in the training. It is in the you know, what we say and, and the analogies we use and, and Eric and Jared have Dr. Tippett's have, have been really good in, in helping me understand that it's, it's about having the right people and creating that right culture. Um, and in cultures created in a lot of ways, we could have a whole nother podcast or five about that, but making sure that I'm 
that ace of the aces constantly that it's not just in in word but in deed and um and making sure that the people that we bring in do fit that concierge model that that want to help model that we talked about earlier and so if i if i felt like i needed to do this in a different part of my life on a different campus if i ever moved on or, or whatever um, that's where I would definitely start. Um, obviously you need funding and obviously you need support, but if you try to run before you're ready, I think this has failed, will fail. And, you know, there, there's some things that we have some advantage of SU. Our, our campus is smaller, so we, we can assign an ACE to every first year student. That's something that we are able to do. Um, but it's not just that it's, it's making sure that you're set up to succeed. And part of that culture is that we will try and fail miserably sometimes but we won't let that define us and we'll keep going and and pushing through this is one of the things that i've heard um is um you had all of the uh eric when you helped create this or led the creation of this uh several years ago you had all of the research done you understood what everybody else was doing you knew what the best practices were and you knew that for whatever reason that wasn't working perfectly here so you were willing to say, I'm going to use the basis of knowledge that I've gained from everybody else's experiences, but I'm going to try to see if I can find something that's uniquely suited to the students here. And, um, and I'm willing to take a risk to do something that's very different. So we abandoned a bunch of programs, started this one. Um, it just seems like it starts with the basis of um, a lot of study, um, both of best practices but then of our own individual needs and uh, and then just created something out of scratch. Yeah, and it's, from I, scratch. I think you're, you're spot on. It's something that I, I try to teach my team that data-driven decisions are very important, but there also comes a time where you just got to trust your gut. And, and that sometimes there may not be data necessarily supporting um, what you're trying to do, but but if you feel that, that there's nothing directly contrary or, or flying in the face, let's give it a whirl. And it, it may not work, but, but let's give it a whirl. So sometimes you just, you just got to go for it and, and mm. try it and learn from it. And, and there's, it wasn't going to sink the ship, um, but yeah. Well, and you needed a support structure uh, of your supervisor who was willing to let you fail. Absolutely. So you had to have some confidence to know that if this doesn't work and the pieces that didn't work, um, the, the ACES program today is very different from <laughs> what it was when you started. Oh, hands yeah. down. Yep. It's not hardly comparable, is it? No, no. So you had to have somebody that was willing to trust you and um, give you a little bit of latitude to succeed and fail and struggle and work through it and and now five six years later it's flourishing and you're looking at how can we you're kind of new into the the uh, the leads the second step which is for the upper class students yep and there's a lot to be learned there there is it every year it's a different group of students that require different things so yeah it's and I, th- I think you bring up a good point that this would not have worked if if dr tippett's had a very short leash on me. Mm-hmm. And if, if president's cabinet wasn't willing to help back or fund more ACEs and the creation and believing in the program and through the shark tank initiatives and being willing to, to fund it. So you're absolutely right. Ideas that aren't funded ideas that don't have support. It can be really, really tough to, to get going and, and find success with. Fantastic. Well, congratulations for a terrific program. We look forward to seeing more come of it. And, uh, we're we're a big university and this is a big world and and just watching innovation happen and see how we can apply it in other areas is half of the fun actually well and and big thanks to you president white not trying to brag on him or put him on the spot but part of this success in even when we're kind of nickel and diamond money to have more aces and build has been your support and and even just you know stopping by the nest and chatting with the aces it, it makes their day it makes them eager to work hard and those days are, are are fun to see president white stopped by and said we're doing a great job or just chatted about life and um the support that you and the president's cabinet and i think um obviously dr tippets and, and and dr kirby eric it's it's made a really good morale and i think 
that's what's exciting to be an ace or to to be a lead is is that it's not just a, a job it's not just helping but you know that you have the support of the campus community which is really awesome well yeah. and they know they're in a big they know they're doing something important yeah that helps motivate them too yeah yeah but that's, thank you yeah that support is not lost on us i hope yeah. you know yep You've been listening to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, who is one year younger than I am, (laughs) and is also the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. We've had as our guests today, Ryan Bailey and uh, Eric Kirby, who are uh, exemplary staff members here that lead our peer mentoring ACES program that's been very successful for us. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Ryan, for joining us. And thank you, our devoted listeners, for tuning in. We'll be back again with another podcast soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu.